Sonia, I am so excited you're here. I've been waiting and waiting for this. Uh, you are one badass lady. We can say that, I think, on Zoom, right? Um, <laughs> you are amazing, and uh, I just like I'm beyond excited. So, um, without further ado, we're gonna kick it off. We got a lot to talk about. I know you have some good stories, so um, I want to talk about your journey to where you let's start a little bit. Uh, for those of you who don't know, you're from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, correct? Yes, yes. uh, and you know, I I'm, I'm a big believer that you know. Our geographies also play a huge part in our perspective too, right? So, um, all right, you've covered a lot of territory, as Marcy said, in your career. Uh, you've worn a lot of hats. Can you tell us briefly a little bit about some of the pit stops along the road there? Sure. Um, I, I always tell people I feel like the, the journey from point A to point B is not always a straight line. And I feel like my career has like been, you know, zigzag, all kind of craziness, but it's been good. Uh, I started out right after college. I went to Howard University in Washington, D.C. I see Marco on the line. I see some other, my other house. <laughs> it's all family um, here. It's all yeah. Family. And um, after I graduated, I was working for, in public affairs uh, for the D.C. government. And uh, I always, uh, when I was growing up in Baton Rouge, I was a big theater person. I was in all the plays or whatever. And I had this idea, was like, I don't want to feel like I missed something or feel like I didn't take a chance. And so I auditioned, got into the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York, moved to New York to go to drama school. I was at the, um, did the academy program there, two year program, graduated. I was out doing the acting thing, waiting tables, da da da, all of that. Um, and also doing freelance PR work at the time. So, um, was doing freelance PR work for music industry. So I was doing stuff for Motown and other um, like PR agencies that work specifically with music acts. Um, did that for a little bit and then um, met uh, my dear friend now, Tim Rasta, who was headed, headed up LifeBeat with the Music Industry Fights AIDS. It was the Music Industry's AIDS organization. Met him at an event. Um, he had me, we were just talking and laughing and drinking. And um, he said, you know, you should come in. And uh, he was talking about the, this thing with Sarah McLaughlin and Lilith Fair. And he said, you should come and do, you should come and do this project for us and go out on Lilith Fair with Sarah McLaughlin. I was like, okay. So um, I went out and I was doing, she had this whole village where she had a lot of nonprofits as part of the, the whole um, festival vibe. And they would do press conferences every town that they stopped into. And I told, I was telling her person after one press conference, I said, God, you talk about all the acts and stuff, which is great, but you, you guys never talk about what's happening in this nonprofit village, which was amazing. They had like rain and they were talking about rape and incest. They had those organizations, they had local organizations and they said, oh, okay. Well, do you want to talk about that at the next press conference? I was like, sure. Okay. Never turned down a microphone. And so I, um, <laughs> You know, I went and I started talking about um, what they were doing in, in the community village. And so Sarah loved it and asked if I could do that for every press conference. And I did. And so because of that, Lifebeat was always getting mentioned <laughs> in the press around the, the tour. And so when I got back uh, from that and they were like, well, would you mind coming on to do, we're doing these World AIDS Day conference, conference, concerts. Would you want to come on and produce the concert? I've never produced a concert in my life, but I was like, okay. <laughs> and so I went and, and produced like their first world, big world AIDS Day conference, uh, con concert. And it had a couple of names that are, you know, people might recognize. They were kind of in the beginning of their journey then, but it was like Destiny's Child and NSYNC and, you know, all of that. And uh, so then it became, well, why don't you come aboard? <laughs> and um, be our com communications director. And so that's how I, start. I, I started um, at LifeBeat as their communications director. And so it was that, that kind of beginning of connecting entertainment with social good. And uh, so I was working at LifeBeat um, doing the AIDS stuff and I got a call from uh, another dear friend of mine, uh, Kelly Lawson, who was at BET at the time and was like, hey, we've just started our public affairs department and 
we did this survey and HIV AIDS is the issue that our, our viewers want to see, will you come over and run this? And once again, okay. And so I uh, went over to BET and really kind of built up the public affairs department there and the campaign. So we started with uh, HIV and AIDS and really developed um, all the voting um, issues, the voting campaigns, breast cancer awareness, education work. And uh, after BET, um, you know, because as we all know who work in, has, have worked in this cable industry, there's that season of cuts and layoffs that start happening. You start seeing it at every, all the other systems and you're like, I know Viacom's coming next. And so, you know, we're the non-revenue generating department. So I was part of that layoff, which I was not upset about actually. And I started doing my own uh, consulting work which was very interesting. I did some stuff for Fox Entertainment for like a year and um, some other political organizations uh, and then got a call about one community and it was different and uh, working in the film industry and having to move to LA. And as I said, never one to turn down uh, a new challenge and that's, that's where I am now. Well, that's quite a quite a path. <laughs> um, I think what what, uh, what I hear overwhelmingly in that whole um, narrative there was that the power of sort of just staying open-minded and saying yes. Yeah. Um, I think that's really the overriding theme in that entire um, story. And I think like, had you said, well, I can't, I've never done that before, or, and also, not only that, but you also followed your instincts too. You're like, there could be something here. Yeah. So it sounds yeah. like there's two really important components there that contributed to, you know, you just kind of riding that wave and being really successful at it. Yeah. And I think one of the things that I had to keep remembering, which I was told before, and it was part of a lot of education. I think it was even something that was told to me. I, I did ELDP that was told to me um, during ELDP by, uh, and I can't remember who said it, but that idea of- Was it Ella? Oh, it, was it Dr. Ella? It was Ella probably Blue? Ella, and I was thinking yeah. it was, it's most yeah. likely it was Ella. Of course. And it's that idea, especially for women and right. women of color, that we, we think that if there are 10 qualifications, we think we have to have nine and a half of them um, in order to, mm. to, to do it. Whereas men, God bless the men on the phone, um, it can have 10 qualifications, and if they have a quarter of one, they're like, Psh, this job is for me. And, you know, we, we don't do that. We, 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 and, and we let opportunities sometimes pass by because we don't think we have the nine and a half qualifications that we think, you know, I've never done this before. Da, da, da. Half the people that do stuff have never done it before. And um, so I... I don't always do it, but I have to try and keep making myself remember, just go, you're, you're, you're smart, you're creative, you know, you can, you can figure it out. And, right. and people are, you can always ask somebody, so you, you have a network, you can ask people. And 100%. so that just became the thing to just, to do it. And I just think if I had, not, if I had said no at any point, um, the opportunities that I would have missed. That's huge. Um, and I think that's probably in this really ever shifting landscape that we're in right now with the job market. I think that's going to be so critical for people to really, I mean, I've had conversations with some of the folks, even on this uh, Zoom meeting here, who we've talked about it. You just got to, okay, it, you know, and, and if you even want to change careers, this is the time to do it because everything's very fluid right now. Yeah. Stay open. Um, and I kind of want to just go to, I was reading that you focus on three main um, points in this when you're sort of driving through this and you mind just kind of reciting those for me? Oh, no, no. Um, one is always about what, what's your passion and understand what that is and, and what it stems from. Um, and then also just in terms of moving, um, understand what you're willing to give up to get there uh, because it's like sometimes, you know, if you're at a, a certain point in your career and you're making a certain salary and you have a certain title and, and those things are important to you and you've worked hard to get there, 
But in order to get to do something that you're really passionate about and that you know is, is going to be impactful or make you happy or, or eventually lead you to where you really want to go, you may have to take a pay cut, you may have to move, you may have to change a title, and you just have to be very clear about what you're willing to give up um, to get to where you ultimately want to go. And also just the, the last part is always the fear. Um, I'm a scaredy cat. I've always been. It, it's always funny when people always say, oh, that was so bold of you. And I'm like, you don't even know how long it took me to get to that decision because I, I am, you know, I like, I, I get settled. And um, to understand that fear is going to be there, but you're going to have to um, risk that challenge and not let, take the risk, be willing to take the risk. There, that, that saying is always leap and the net will appear. And you have to, to, to think that. Don't let the fear become the thing that keeps you from where you're supposed to be. And so often we, we, we let the fear keep us from, from making a bold choice, um, but you have, to, you have to kind of let the fear go. Thank you so much for saying that because that is, um, to me, that's a really important message uh, as well because um, I think that, um, that a lot of people, they, they look at your title, they look at my title and they think, oh, well, you know, that's nice that you, you made it, but they don't really know that you kind of, you, I, you know, many people go through so many ups and downs to get there. And it's really just, uh, you know, how much do you want it? What is it you want and how much do you want it? And, you know, you're more than capable of getting there. So I think it's really important to drive that home. We all can do this. It's, yeah. it's, yeah. Uh, I've heard this over and over about, you know, panels. Oh, well, you know, when people are on panels, they talk about how great they are. But they don't tell us like how difficult it was. It's always difficult. <laughs> yeah. I always say it's like, it's social media. Like you curate what you put in your bio. I'm not putting, I didn't put like, oh, uh, a temp agency receptionist because I don't type really fast. Right. I couldn't get the typing job. So I did the receptionist. Right. That's not the stuff you curate the good stuff, yeah. um, but it's not all that. And I feel like right. you always have to talk. I, I always like you need to talk about everything so people understand that it was not, you know, oh, just this path that it was so easy. And it's like, no, I was waiting tables. I was doing right. reception. For, there was just there were many points. But, you know, unfortunately, you don't have enough room for all that. No one cares about that on right. your bio or but the that, fear. That's all you know, part the of fear. It. Yeah, the yeah, fear. Yeah, the fear. And the fear. Sure everybody, you know, it's. Change is hard. Yeah. Changing directions is hard. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. So thank you for breaking that uh, down, um, sort of your work history. It's great to hear all that. I, I'd love to move on to sort of um, the term SIE, social impact entertainment. Um, can you kind of just tell us what that is, first of all? Yeah. So it is the idea that, which we've kind of always had, but uh, putting this name to it, the idea of the development of entertainment um, pieces like movies and television shows and documentaries that are really focused on being able to change an issue or bring attention to an issue, bring policy change to an issue. Um, and so there's a lot of talk about social impact entertainment. I personally just call things entertainment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because when you say social impact entertainment, it, it puts it in a, a category. And there are certain things that fit more in that category, like certain documentaries and, and that piece. But I feel like during doing my work, and, and we've done this, it has been so many different names and iterations of what it is. But even from, from BET and, and the stuff we all did at Viacom, using entertainment to do social good, like using entertainment to bring attention to an issue, using entertainment to um, educate, just kind of, as we always say, putting the, the, the spinach and the brownies, like we're, we're educating you, but you don't really know because it's fun. You're laughing and you're enjoying <laughs> right, right. this work, but it's, it's letting you get um, proximate to an issue. And so I just always try to just say entertainment because when it's social impact, people think it's an after school special. Um, right. But it can be... Um, using anything to be able to um, educate and to uplift and to amplify uh, some message or an issue that we want people to take action on. Excellent. Um, 
before I launch into my next question, I just want to, uh, something I neglected to mention earlier, um, this is going to go about, uh, it's going to go a little bit longer than an hour, so we'll be going to about 1.15. I just wanted to say that, so people uh, don't sign off. We're going to probably get to questions, I think, in about maybe 25, 30 minutes, um, so stick around if you can. Um, what, how do you go about you know, deciding which projects you think are, are worth getting involved in? Um, well, from the perspective of where I am now at One Community, um, the idea, so One Community is a film finance and social impact company. And so we're always very clear. It's just not like the, the, the company that just finances a film. Right. Our whole thing is to look at those films and decide on those films that have uh, something that we feel that we can do an impact uh, campaign around. And we look at issues, our, our big thing is, is on a bigger banner of things around equity and inequality, equity and equality. Mm -hmm. And so our development team looks at all these scripts and they get, you know, submissions in and everything we have kind of a lens that we look at everything around. One, is it a great story? Because if it's not a great story, you know, the first thing you need people to see it. Um, if it's not a great story, if it's not something you think people are going to see, then you're not going to be able to do anything around it. So that's always the, the kind of first lens that, that everyone looks at. And then we also, we also look at, you know, who, who's telling the story? Um, because we want to be, we want to be open to new voices. We want to say, if it is a story about, um, you know, uh, Latinx community, is this a Latinx voice that's telling the story? Um, or, you know, all of that. So we kind of look at all of that also, and then look right. at what is the issue in this story? Um, and, and kind of contrary to the belief of it's going to be an issue movie, you know, our, our first project that we did with Warner Brothers was just mercy and so that was just yeah it was very much criminal justice reform it was very straight and you knew it going in but we also look at um films because we don't want it to be just that because that's not when you always get the audience we're looking at a uh, big budget like is it a marvel film is it like one of the last dc comic films i think um shazam had a young person with a disability and then there was also foster care and so it was not like the the, the through line of the story it's something that was part of the story mm -hmm. and then that's something that you can take that and then amplify and and do something around that so we that's all we kind of look at all of that is this is this a story once again is the is it a good story um is it dealing with an issue and also maybe dealing with it in a way that is different than it's ever been dealt with before. Um, so it's it, kind of, you're making sure that you're not just doing it, but you're like advancing it. You're, you're moving the needle a bit. Yes, something yes. out there that hasn't been out there before, maybe on, on that subject, right? Yeah, so that we're always looking for that, you know, but then there's also, you know, it's a blockbuster and there's something you can, you right. can do with yeah. that. But I think our content person, which I love, always uses um, District 9. Uh, mm -hmm. as, a, as an example of the kind of projects we look for, because, you know, in that type of film, you're able to touch on an issue. Like it's basically, you're talking about apartheid, you know, you're talking about segregation. You, you know, you think of Get Out, like the, all the issues in that, that you can put to the forefront in a way that it, it's showing it in a different way. Um, animation, right. all of those things bring forth issues in a different way. So we love looking for those types of projects as well. That's fantastic. And then what's, in, what's involved? So, you know, you get a script um, and you decide you're going to take it on, then what happens after that? Um, well, on, on our end, because um, we're in the kind of finance part of it, so we're working with like, will the studio let us into that movie? Because <laughs> we love it. Um, and so once, if we're, if we're signed on into the movie, we're working with the studio um, from my perspective and my department, we work with the studio and the marketing team saying, hey, this is what, as we looked at this movie, this movie is about, um, say, uh, immigration. Uh, this movie's about immigration and 
we have already started as we're reading the script thinking of how do we approach an immigration story and kind of the things that we'd like to do uh talking with the marketing department to make sure we're we're kind of working hand in hand because we don't want something to go against the way they're trying to market the film you know right. we may want to do something around immigration that um kind of you know maybe politicizes the film because you need to get people in you, you want to get butts in the seats and yeah uh, so we work with them and how do we how do we best uh go about what we're trying to do from an impact perspective then for us and this is something i used to used to do uh at bet because my thing was always we know our audience we know what programming to put out to our audience but we are not issue experts so it's always who do we partner with and who do we bring to the table to say this is um this is what we want to do. How do we get there? And so, for example, for Just Mercy, we did two, um, I always call them like genius stuff. We call them brain trust now. We did two brain trust meetings. Um, one we did at Warner Brothers in LA, one we did um, in New York, and brought together all of these organizations, individuals from different areas of criminal justice reform who were working on criminal justice reform. Um, that was an easy, one and a lucky one because everyone knew Brian's work. Everyone knew Brian Stevenson. Everyone had read Just Mercy, the book. Um, and so we're like, okay, you, you know the book. We have this piece of content that's your, it's going to be Jamie Foxx and Michael B. Jordan. And we have this opportunity with this piece of content to really uplift this conversation and, and maybe get some more action going around criminal justice reform. There's so many issues in that, in that one mm -hmm. issue. What, what is happening right now, do you think, within the next, now to the next year or something? Because they were just starting filming, so we had a little while now. Um, to going forth within the next two, two even two to three years, are the, are the main kind of issues that are happening. Where do you think there are tipping points mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. using this movie, um, using this piece of content, as a as a um, as a point of reference for the the work, where do you think we can do good around this? So, of course, you know everyone's in a different thing. You get a hundred million different uh, different opinions, and so we took all of that, kind of came back and and distilled it and did more conversations and brought it down a little more, and then came up with how we were going to approach um, approach that work. Then we go back to the studios, and even though People from the studios were part of both of that thing. This is what this is what we're looking at um, for this particular campaign. Working with them, are there adjustments and and all of that? And so there's a lot of conversation. Um, there's a lot of meeting because my thing is always we are not the we're not the total movers of the impact because there are people who have been people in organizations who have been on the ground for years trying to move the needle on this work, um, who have been making the progress. And I, I always say the worst thing that we can do in, in kind of this entertainment arena is come in and say, oh, look, look what we did. We did all of this and not and negate the work of all those people. So my thing is always every, those voices have to be at the table and those voices have to shape what we're doing. And our work is really to use this content and use kind of the platform that we have to reach all of the people that we can and the influencers and the celebrity or whatever the culture reach that we have to amplify and accelerate the work that's already happening so that that's kind of how we we did this and so we worked in partnership with people on um, organizations throughout the uh, kind of entire campaign. And so you kind of figure out what you're doing from, on a level of like the grassroots work. Are you doing, are you working with um, or NBA players? Are you working with celebrities? Are, are there things you're gonna do on the digital front? Um, are there things you're gonna do in community with art? Because our thing is really also to use a lot of culture, culture to, to, to uh, move the needle or get policy or, or get attention to that issue. So mm -hmm. first and foremost, it's always having those conversations with the people who know the issue and then working with them to develop 
um, the campaign and then using kind of all of our avenues within media and entertainment to accelerate and amplify the work um, that's always been done on these issues going forward. That's great insight. Um, thank you for that. Now, do the studios, um, how do they, how do they handle that? I mean, I, I was reading a little bit that, um, you know, studios have become more socially conscious, socially impact conscious. I mean, is that accurate? And, um, you know, so when you present, I'm sort of asking you two things here, is that accurate? And B, when you present what the campaign is going to be, how, how do they receive that? Um, I think, I think yes to the first question, um, because there are more and more conversations about that. There are more and more, um, people and then just from 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 a business perspective their audience that is that you may reach that the campaign may reach and that these organizations may reach that may not have been necessarily the audience that was going to go to that film so it is you you're you're broadening your reach number one so there is there has been more um kind of acceptance of this work and and seeing the value in this work how long, and, ha I just, I'm sorry, just so I can capture this right now, like how long do you think that's been going on? Like the last decade or what um, is the pulse on that? I, I definitely think, uh, I feel like maybe over the last decade, but I think in the last, really more in the last four or five years mm -hmm. from my perspective. And so I can't, I don't, yep. only speak from my perspective. <laughs> I think it's just from my perspective in the last four or five years, you've been seeing or hearing more of it. Um, for us, just my experience uh, with Just Mercy and with Warner Brothers was so great. Like they were, and also I think because they so believed in this piece of content, they so believed in this film um, that they were so um, willing and accepting. And like I said, they were there from the beginnings of the conversations and the brain trust. They, they were there, especially when we were on the Warner's Brothers lot. There were like people from all departments who were part to just kind of hear what people were saying. And um, they were great. They were fantastic. Um, I, and I will say fantastic, even when probably we were doing some things that were not traditionally done for them uh, at that point in the game. And we're very right very open to um, us doing it. And yeah, I, I, I'm not sure because, you know, this is a fairly new position still for me and we've just done the work with Warner Brothers, but I, I tell the folks at Warner Brothers, like, like, wow, this was great. This is gonna be, you know, I hope everyone, every experience um, is going to be like that. But from, from the top on down, they were, they were um, right there. Um, with us and and dealing with my 50 million phone calls and just always <laughs> making sure is this okay we're looking at doing this or um, constantly and it has it was a it was really really um, wonderful to work with them and that is something that they are really passionate about so um, I think that it is something that the industry is doing I hope so because you know it's not it's not, um, doesn't cost them really extra. And there's so much that can be done with a piece of content that you can't do when people are giving you a report or a, um, you know, right. something from the CDC or, or, or whatever. I, I learned that at BT. The CDC even used to say, you know, we can put all the reports in the world, but we get the phone calls to the hotline after you've aired one of your, you know, new specials on on one of the things, or after like the PSAs that you did dropped, it's that that idea of of culture really shapes and moves so much of what happens, kind of from a policy perspective, and it's usually culture first, and then the policy happens. And so there's such power in um, narrative work. There's such power in in the um, images that we put out in the storytelling that, you know, I just feel like we are, we miss and we're kind of foolish not to use it um, and use it for good. I always say, cause you can use it the other way and it has been done, but to be able to use that for good because that, that is what moves everything. Of course. Were you uh, totally satisfied with the impact Just Mercy made? Um, 
I th and it's still working. Like the campaign is still like, and that's the other thing. The campaigns usually are not just, you know, part of, of the movie. The idea is to have the work continue. And that's kind of a jumping off point and you use that mm -hmm. to, but the campaign is still going on. I mean, COVID has, has uh, switched some stuff. And okay. so, uh, but there was a lot of work that was done around uh, DA, DA work. And you're looking at, because if you look at the movie, it's the, and, and in so much that we talk about that's happening in the world now, your prosecutors and judges have a big say in that. And people don't, a lot of people don't realize you, you, you vote for those folks. You so you, you vote for your sh sheriffs and you have to understand what they do. So there's been a lot of work around prosecutorial reform that's been happening uh, as a part of the campaign. They've been doing work, yes, on um, death penalty, also on educating DA offices. Uh, so that work has still been happening post the movie. So um, yes, and, and there was a lot of work with even educating and bringing, part of the thing is, as we talk about culture again, who are those messengers, the voices that you need to, to bring into this issue? So one of the things that happened during when we were working on the campaign um, represent justice around Just Mercy was to really bring sports figures in. So we did screenings for a lot of the um, NBA teams. And a lot of those players started really speaking out around criminal justice reform. And so you want to bring those voices in because that that brings in a whole nother audience that brings in people who may watch the games and follow these folks have not thought about criminal justice reform, did not know about it. But then now you have the person you idolize, the person you follow, start talking about it. And then you may open your eyes and look at that. So um, in a sense, I always I, I'm never satisfied. I always think there's always more and more and more that could have been done. But I think there was a good um, bit of the work, um, doing that work and bringing people into that conversation and educating folks that was done that I'm, yeah, we're really, really, really proud of. Smart move to bring an MBA because you're, you're absolutely correct. They have become these very powerful messengers. And obviously, you know, when we look at what's happening now, um, they will have a role in what's happening, you know, as, as the world continues to evolve here. Um, was that a spontaneous decision or had you, is that one of your, you know, uh, tricks no. in the toolbox there? Yeah, yeah, that's one of um, what we feel as part of who we are as one community is to be able to use culture to, to shift, shift, shift narrative, shift policy, issue engage. And so everything that we look at is like where, what's the culture piece that we can bring in? Is this, mm -hmm. do we use art? Do we use music? Do we, so it's like, how can we use all of those tools um, to bring those messages out to to get people to get engaged in an issue. Uh, yeah, so that's always been that's always a part of the process of of what what very tools, good. Yeah, that that we can use culture wise. Um, and, and what uh, was that? Would you say that that was the most uh, fulfilling or impactful project you worked on to date, or would you have another one that that? Uh... I, I still, um, for me, and I think possibly because it was a multi, multi-year thing is wrap it up when I was at BT. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it started at a time when there was still such a big stigma around HIV and AIDS. Right. And a time when the, the numbers were, you know, when, when HIV and AIDS first got, got on the scene, sounds horrible, but when, you know, it was primarily thought of it was a gay disease uh, right. and and so the gay community was the the community that really started raising their voices about this and that attention needed to be put towards that and then the numbers the the numbers started showing that it was really really becoming a black disease that mm -hmm. that the numbers the black community was really being affected and so it was around that time that, and people weren't really talking about it. And so I know when I started, when we started the campaign um, and we started, we do PSAs and we do some news specials. And then we really worked to um, break that stigma, to, to use people to talk 
and educate, you know, uh, we would do. And I, I'm so grateful to uh, Stephen Hill and all the other folks in the kind of music production department who would give us 106 and Park, which was the top rated show at that time for young people every World AIDS Day. And we would be able to do a World AIDS Day show. So we talk about uh, protection and we talk about, we, people would do on-air HIV tests and we'd bring people who are HIV positive on onto the show and and we did like i think over the course of that campaign maybe like 80 psas and uh x number of news specials on the network and then we'd also take it out in the community and i think that's one of the things that i love the most you're used to seeing stuff on air and it's a network you're you're expected to see stuff on air but we would go out in the community we'd go uh, travel across the country and do these team forums and we'd bring an, a celebrity and, and someone who's HIV positive and just go around and, and we do stuff at BT events. And so when they did these, they used to do a black college tour and we would do bring local um, HIV AIDS organizations in to do on-site HIV testing. And at first everyone was like, well, this is a fun, you know, thing. We're not sure about doing that. And, and the lines would be lined up because no one, especially for folks kind of in that age group, that younger age group, no one was really talking to them about this. And they just heard like people were getting infected, but they weren't getting the information. And so at one point, Wrap It Up was considered, and this was like from, from all these agencies and people who were working on HIV and AIDS, that it was considered at one point the largest public information campaign on HIV and AIDS to African Americans mm -hmm. in the country. And wow. so um, we're really proud of, I was really, really proud of that because uh, because of that work, because we started to normalize that conversation, because we were doing measurements on everything that we did. Every PSA had the hotline number where we can track the calls to the CDC. Um, every um, show or PSA later on had SMS code. I feel like that shows how old I am because people don't even know like, those codes in your pager anymore. But everything had all of that so that we can track measurement and movement that people were actually taking action as a result of the, the content that was put, being put out. And then um, I think for me, and it's, it's one thing out of everything of those years that we did that campaign and in partnership with Kaiser Family Foundation was that one show that we did on 106 and Park um, we had this young woman, and it was always hard to find young people who were HIV positive who were willing to talk because at yes. that age, it's just a lot. Like you of don't. Of course. So there was a young woman um, who was infected at the age of 18. Um, we found her at, at some, I think, event we did in in Memphis, and um, she is such a firecracker, uh, Marvelyn Brown, who I just adore, and. We had her, she started being part of our Wrap It Up campaign and we had her on the World AIDS Day special and, and she's beautiful and she's lively and fun and she's just, and she basically said, I have HIV, but that's not who I am. And she's talked about her life and, and what she's been doing and, and all of that. And she shared with me a, a, a message that she got from a young man who had just gotten, um, who had just gotten diagnosed and he basically told her that I was going to kill myself because I couldn't see how I can live with this. And then I saw you on 106 in Park and it made me think, I get teary eyed. Every, it made me think that I do have a future. And I, I said for whatever, you know, I don't know how much can top that for me because it reminds you that Things, anything, everything you do has an effect on someone and you actually could save a life. And you're never, a lot of times you will never know that. And this is the time that we, we heard it. And um, I take that with me all the time. And that's always in the back of my head that you could actually save a life doing this and the importance of it. And so for me, just like that's always my answer for my most meaningful work, because I feel like it's also because I did it for so long and was kind of entrenched in that community for so long. But that that one 
note. It just seals it like I can't I can't say anything that that um, is more meaningful to me than that. Understandably, I mean that uh, pretty much transcends everything right there. I think that's very real. And thank you for sharing that story. That it's pretty incredible. Um, well, now we're dealing with uh, life after witnessing George Floyd's murder. Yeah. Uh, and clearly, I mean, he is one of many, many, many people who have uh, been needlessly victimized or killed. Um, and so uh, the world too is, is the world's changed. The world has definitely changed. Um, you know, people are, it unleashed a lot of anger and, and passion and just so many emotions. Um, so now what? Now what happens to you in your work? I would say you're, you have your work cut out for you. Yeah, it, it, it is a really, um, it's a really interesting time. <laughs> I was just on a panel right before this and, and we were, it was supposed to be, we we're talking to mid-year in review and, and you, you forgot what happened. You know, it's just, I, I, I'm calling this year kind of, it feels like the 10 commandments, like there's a plague and today is the locust and then the fish, you know, you, the murder hornets are coming. You just, it's they say so there's not much. 10. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, and I think for, for, for the George Four, George Floyd and the Breonna Taylor and the Amon Arbery and all of this, even, even like the COVID crisis is just laid bare a lot of things that we've tried to hide um, yeah. in our society. Uh, it's laid bare the, the, the health inequity, it's laid bare um, the, the economic inequity, uh, it's laid bare the fact that we, we never, uh, as a country, talk about uh, race and the effects of race, racial bias and racism in this country. Um, my dad was a history professor, and so I'm always, you know, by fault, default, thinking of things in terms, historical terms. And so when I think of this work um, and narrative and imagery, everything, I feel like everything that happens has always had a, has a line back to history and it has a line back to narrative. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think of after, you know, even, you know, and it's controversial and, and thoughts around, you know, policing and uh, the idea that you're always seeing killings and you're seeing the, the, you're seeing them on video. And the idea, even going back to the lynching period, that was a sport, that was something you looked at, that was video. But the, the value, part of all of this is also the, what is the value of, of, of Black life right now? And the narrative has been, um, the stories is that it doesn't have value. So you're taught, you know, even in school, you're taught there's slavery, then you don't see anybody again till if you get to that chapter, right. Martin Luther King, right. and then you go on. Um, then the narrative of, of all, you know, back in the day, you didn't see um, black people on, in your movies or on TV unless they were in certain roles. They were subservient. They were, you know, your servants. Uh, they were the mammy. They were, or they were the criminal or shiftless. And, and so when that's the narrative and culture permeates everything, and if that narrative has been taught and has been put to you throughout time, and if you have not seen other images, um, if you have not heard or, or allowed other people to tell other stories, then that's all you know. Mm -hmm. If you watch the news all the time, you know, it's, it's not, look at this young man who did this or whatever. It's the first story, like criminals who did this. Um, that's always top of mind. So right. that's, that's kind of how we got to this part where there's, it's not, you know, that 
there is this feeling of there's no value in the life. So we get there. And so it's also now people who have been trying to say what has been going on for a long time and, and folks either didn't believe it, didn't want to hear it, are kind of, I hate saying like waking up to it because that, that idea is the alarm has been sounded and, and the snooze button just kept being hit. But, um, and in this time, it's just interesting also in this time of everyone's home, and you're not doing, you know, all of your stuff right. that your, your, your focus and attention is there now. And then people are at the point of like, enough is enough. There are names and names and names that we can bring out what is going to change and what is the narrative? How do we shift this narrative? How do we shift um, what is happening? It, it, it's, so I was researching something else and then I come upon, there's a video from 1969 of the actress Ruby D reading the names of young black men who were killed by the police. And I'm like, here we are in 2020 and wow. it's the same thing. Wow. So yes, the, the, the work, <sighs> you know, yeah. now is, is, is definitely, um, is definitely important. It's, it's, it's about one, the storytelling, um, how do we also get different stories out out and and I think now you're seeing more and more stories from different voices uh, showing different facets mm -hmm. you're getting more and more stories. I know color of change did a a, a great report on the police procedurals that you see like law and order everyone's always law and order and the cops and and stuff and how law and order just even watching law and order which been it's like 17 different spinoffs. It's on every channel all day long, any channel you turn to and how that has also changed, made a narrative, a mm -hmm. narrative of, you know, uh, defense attorneys are bad and, and shifty. You know, the prosecutor is always, you know, He's it's, they're usually yep. right. The co and, and so <laughs> you get juries in like different situations who are always, okay, you know, because it's been ingrained. Yes, I'm going to believe the prosecutor. That must be right. They're never going to do all of that. So one is, is, is shifting some of that work, shifting some of the stories that are being told because a, a bias is formed. So much of our values, our biases are formed by culture, by, by things that we're immersed in. So shifting some of those stories and in the immediate, wow, there's just so much work to be done. Um, just in the immediate, it is, you know, having those conversations because nothing changes without conversation and having real conversation and having difficult conversation. Because when we talk about all this, it's difficult and it brings up a lot, but we've never, as a country, we've never really had those real conversations. And, and having those conversations and facilitating those conversations through different forms, through different media forms, through different things you have. You have a, a show, put it in the show, like put something around it, a storyline um, in that show that has that conversation that shows a different viewpoint um, than what you have. It, I don't even know, like I'm so overwhelmed, honestly, right now with everything that's going on and, and feeling this, um, you know, kind of bubbling up uh, of, of things that between just so, because so much is going on and, and people's emotions and anger and frustration and sadness and fear um, right now is, is like on level 10, right. even how to start addressing some of it. And right. I think part of it and, and what I was telling, we were talking about that as a company because we we believe in, in social impact work and, and how we can move things forward. And even, you know, uh, not having a project that specifically deals with all this right now, we're like, what can we do? And the idea is how can we help? We really say that narrative storytelling piece is our lane. So how can we help organizations in their storytelling? How can we help people in their narrative around this time, around what needs to be done, around what 
do we put out, you know, around messaging that helps people understand what's going on and understand the actions that can be taken to address these problems. So that's kind of where I am now in, I know it's like blah, 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 in what's happening now, but it's just, it's, it's, it's so much and you're still dealing with COVID and like, and it's still all evolving. Yeah. It's all, it's still all yeah. evolving as well. And you don't know, you know, the conditions I think are so different daily, literally. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it, it will be, I mean, you've certainly got your work cut out for And bam, there's an election coming up. You know? Oh yeah, there's that. Yeah. So, so you're thinking it. voter suppression and how do we get people to vote? Right. The, yeah. Right. It's, it's, right. Or, you know, we get a vaccine, how is that going to be distributed? I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. So yeah, this is uh, going on for a while and you have definitely a lot of work to do. Um, but I mean, it's really, it's amazing, amazing work. So great to hear from you on all this. So I think we should, if you're good with it, I'd love to take some questions. Um, Danielle, have you been gathering some questions there? Uh, yes, I've been gathering a couple of questions, um, and I have a question from Chandra Caldwell. This question is concerning uh, activating your network. She is asking about how does she, she doesn't really know a lot, well, she knows a lot of people, but she doesn't know how to utilize them. Could you give us uh, a bit of advice on, you know, what approach yeah. it would, you know, she should take? That's a great question. And it's one that I, I always have struggled with. Um, and I, I still do to this day, honestly. I, so it's hard for me to like, this is what you should do because sometimes I'm not really doing it. But I can tell you from what I tell folks about how I like, you know, use when I tell people to use me, um, I call. I'm always like, call me, reach out to me. Sometimes I can help, sometimes I can't or sometimes I can put you towards someone who can help. So I think the first thing is to never ever feel that you can't reach out to people. And that's just the first thing, always you know, reach out and say exactly what you need assistance with. Um, I am trying to switch careers. I'm trying to get in a different area. I need to talk to someone in this or I need an in at this particular place. Be just very direct about exactly what you need and say, hey, I, I don't even know if this is this is something you might be able to help with, but I just thought I could reach out. And then you never know. Like it's always like, oh you know what? I don't know someone. I know I have a friend. Someone always friend knows someone, there. right? Yeah. I feel like mm -hmm. everyone, uh, you know, people in your network, it's 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 six degrees. Like someone knows someone. And um not everyone, but I feel like most people are willing to, to, to help in some way. It may not be all the way that you need, but are willing to help in some way. I think we just have to get over, my thing is always like, oh, I don't want to bother someone, or is this person that I only have one ask, and is this the ask I want to make of that person, and all that kind of goes in your head, but I, I think it's the thing of just um, just reaching out and then looking at doing your research also before, like looking at who, what does that person do? You know, if you're on the social media, you're like kind of who do they know? Looking at their LinkedIn, who are their friends? And, and you can be specific about, you know, um, Marco Williams. I need to reach him. I personally would never reach out to Marco Williams. We're really good for I have to mess with him. Um, but you know, if you know that person, and I know that they do this, can you facilitate an introduction? So even do some of the research, because the, the, my thing is that when you come with me and you have a very specific question, and that helps, that helps me without me having to think, 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 what can I do? Who do I know? Oh, you want to meet? Oh, sure. Let me, let me put you guys on an email, you know, together. So I think it's that, um, I think we're just always nervous about reaching, but it, it just the first step is calling folks. And once again, I'm not great with it. So I don't know if my answer was helpful um, because it's something I struggle with all the time as well. But I think we have to just get over that. People expect it, um, people do it themselves. So we have to learn to do the same thing. I think you're hundred percent, 100% accurate. I think that you, we all need to be bolder. I think just historically um, people of color, 
do feel like they're imposing, but I also, so I think you have to be bold, but I think you're absolutely correct also on do your homework first, because when you're making an ask, that doesn't mean expect those folks to do the heavy lifting for you. So make sure you've done the research that you are as specific as you can or focused, focused as you can be. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect, but at least so that you know what you're aiming for. So people can, help, it, they'll stand a better chance of helping you out. Yeah. What else you got, Danielle? So the next question comes from Kai Smith. This question is about obstacles and maybe experiences or pain points that you may have experienced in your career. Uh, what are the biggest challenges in your work? And are there some ways or are there strategies that you've implemented to overcome them? Um, I think sometimes the biggest obstacle was me. Uh, either, you know, I'm always like, yeah, I talk to everyone. I'm I great advice for everyone, but sometimes I don't follow my own advice. So I think uh, one thing, and it, it goes back to from even from the beginning, uh, one obstacle for me is always the fear of something um, and having to work through that. You know, my thing is like either they can all, only say no or you, it doesn't work out and you learn a lesson from it and move on. But you don't always remember that in the moment that you're like in the moment. Um, but I think there's also for me personally, like the obstacles, you, you're always thinking of what's next. And how can I do this better? Uh, I don't know, Kai, that's a difficult question. I'm trying to, um, there have been so many obstacles uh, in terms of like how, you know, I love my work at BET. Sometimes it was like pushing a boulder up a hill to be very honest, because, you know, it, it's the work, once again, it's not the revenue generating work. It's, it's you know, trying to, get folks to understand the value of it, the value of it to um, just the audience, the value of it to the brand was, was sometimes very difficult, but you, you know, you just, I just had to kind of push forward because it goes back to the passion and belief in whatever it is. And so when you have that, when you don't have passion and belief for it, it's the obstacles seem unsurmountable, but if you have passion and belief in what you do, then you, you find a way to just push forward with it. And my darling Kai, I don't know if that was, you know, right answer, but it's just that that's how I always approach um, whatever obstacles come through um, is to, to find a way to, to push forward. And sometimes it's after I've banged my head and I'm bloody and, and been fighting um, and want to give up. But if my passion is there, if I know it is something if that needs to happen, then I, then I push through it. And so you, you find you find that kind of inner inner badass and, and try and make it happen. But Sonia, isn't it sometimes too <clears throat> like a case of timing or just things have to line up? I mean, you know, the universe, God, whomever, um, you know, is stalling you out for a reason because there's some there is something better. And I, I know the jobs that I didn't get that I was so convinced I should have gotten. Um, and then you're so happy. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> I am so grateful for, I mean, somebody was looking out for me for sure. Yeah. Um, I always believe that you're, you're always where you're supposed to be when you're supposed right. to be. Whether right. you think it at that time or not. Um, oh, you never think it at the time. You never think it at that time. And you're just like, no. why didn't I, I need, that should have been mine. And then you go like, yeah. That, yeah. Mm, no, I'm so I glad. Yeah. Been, and I mean, cause you're convinced yeah. you were great for that role, or, you oh, yeah. know, yeah. but, but I think timing, um, I think all the, the, stars have to line up. And um, I think that the main message though that you have is great. And that is just kind of keep pushing. Don't let that derail you. Yeah. Don't be discouraged. Yeah. Danielle, more? Okay. So the next question, well, I should say it's a statement and a question comes from Cliff Decatra, one of our board members. He is, um, you know, first let me just state what he's saying. He's saying that for maybe the first time in my memory, major brands are shaping up and supporting Black Lives Matter and real inclusion initiatives. We know it will take time, but when do you predict that these changes will have an actual impact and effect, genuine change in the 
section of black and brown people and how they are portrayed in film and television and the news. Wow. Um, yeah, you're seeing a lot of it. And, and my hope is that it is not, it is actually movement and not marketing. Um, because it's not, uh, let's take, oh, I know what's happening right now. We're all going to, you know, put our, our, our black uh, campaigns out um, right now. I applaud the people who've been doing it for a minute. Um, and there are some new to, new to the party. And uh, hopefully it is them realizing that, you know, this country is changing. And that's why I feel like there's a lot of disturbance right now because people are majority is, you know, it, they're realizing the country's changing and it is about to be a, a more brown and black people of color country. And if, you know, you cannot, and, and just even the numbers, like we over index in, you know, social media stuff and going to, you know, we go to movies, we watch television and we have to start seeing ourselves and our stories in those spaces. And, and there's, there's such a power that comes from seeing yourself um, portrayed. And you know, there's not enough of it. How I think we're starting to see more. You're starting to hear from people who are telling different stories, who are showing different facets of, of who we are. Um, and those stories are being accepted and, and, and being mainstream. But, and I think you're seeing more of it now because luckily we have more outlets and we're able to produce our own stuff. If you're not going to do it, we can produce it and put it out ourselves. I can make a movie on an iPhone about my life and I can put it out there. And I think that is, is, is what's going to help as we continue. Will the corporate part of it, they still have a long journey. Um, I think, you know, they're doing more of it, but I, I'm hoping I'm praying that they understand um, just for people of color like most of us in NAMIC, that just the, the importance that comes from seeing yourself in a story. Seeing yourself. In a story, in a corporation. In a corporation. For, like in a corporation. everywhere. Yeah, at the everywhere. store, wherever. To see yourself because we're out there and, and we're working and we're fabric and part of, of this country. We're part of this community. We're a part of these, these brands, you know, but you have to, you know, that you have to be able to see yourself and see all of yourself and not the narrative that someone has put forth about you and that continues. And I, I always say for me, you know, as a young girl, I, I was lucky. I grew up in a house, once again, my father was a history professor. One of his big things was black history. So I grew up in a house hearing stories and seeing you know, stuff. And, and I just remember one of the first images that I, I saw was in his office. He had this big poster of Angela Davis. I was like six, had no idea, but I just like, big hair. I was like, wow, she's just, it was something powerful about her and I will always, you know, just remember like I had, that was something I can take with me. I saw someone that I wanted to be. No idea who she was, what she did or whatever, but something about that was powerful. I knew that's what I wanted to be. To be able to have those images for young people, to be able to have those images for people who have never been in contact with a person of color and all their image of them comes from law and order or cops or a video or whatever, and, and they've seen one side. And, 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 and to, for people to say, I remember when the Cosby show came out and I, I was doing my actress phase, then I was waiting tables. And uh, uh, one of the guys who was a waiter was just like, oh, that the Cosby show, that's just so unreal. They're, they're black people with doctors and da, 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 da. And I was like, well, Holmes, I don't know where you're from, but you know, in my house, like, when you address my, you know, you go out, people call my father Dr. Lockett. He has a doctorate. There's a such and such. My friends whose fathers are medical doctors, you're such and such. Yeah, we went on vacation. So I was like, I, I don't know your background, but that's not unreal to me. Like, that's me seeing, yeah, I know these people. You know, that's, I know these people, you know, and so 
Right. Uh, I think, I, I think yeah. like that's the thing um, that is just sort of fascinating to me is that, um, you know, you have people with their signs, Black Lives Matter, and then you have other folks who are saying well, all lives matter. And it's like, don't you understand? We're not saying it's going to be all black and all brown. What we're saying is, can we just balance it out to reflect the rest of society? Yeah. Can we just balance the power out, the decision-making, the power to just be as well-rounded as your everyday city, geography, whatever. And it, it kind of blows me away that people seem to think that we want to completely, but I mean, at some point, can we not balance it out so it's fair? Yeah, <laughs> and it's like they you want to, something gets taken away. Like if, right. if, if you say that Black Lives Matter and we're trying to have like all representation, that something gets taken away. No, and plus you have like, hit years and years of representation you know you've owned it this whole time, time. Like, it's not like and, you, know. if you get a slice you're not going to have any more yeah, it's, you it's owned everything that. you've owned yeah, everything and that, and that right. whole the black lives matter but all lives matter like no one's saying all lives don't matter it's not like i go and go yeah you know i have brain cancer well like ugh, i don't want to hear about that because colon cancer is what's important no like it's it's right. you know right now there's a crisis so can we talk about what's happening there. You know, right. all of us matter. We know this, that is a given. Um, but we don't really feel like you're feeling like these lives matter. And so that's right. what we're talking about. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's crazy, but that's the narrative piece again. You know, it's, right. it's how you twist it and how you uh, tell, tell the story. Right, right. Danielle, you have any more? Yeah, so, yeah, I have, uh, can we take one more question? And this at least one, and then we'll see where we're at. Yep. Okay. So this question is in terms of like dealing with um, work in the COVID space um, by Marcy Perez. She wants to know, can you give some advice for entrepreneurs concerned about keeping their busyness thriving? Do they write out the pandemic and, and the economy and try to go back in-house? So wow. what the wisdom <laughs> uh, I don't even know if I have wisdom on, on there because it is just so <laughs> right now um, right. even in-house you know people are right. talking you know we, we're talking about it honestly like um, you know in the industry because you know production is shut down and and it it is I don't know if I have an answer to that one I um, I think looking at the research is depending on on what what you are doing um, as as a as a company. Uh, I definitely think some things, you know, some things will come back. Uh, some I think everything is just going to be hard. I think internally, it's going to be hard. Uh, in house, I think you know, as uh, as entrepreneurs, it's 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 really 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 hard. I don't really have an answer. We don't know where it's going. The people who are in-house may not be there tomorrow. Right. You know, right. Uh, there's just no, there's, there's, we're in, you know, just kind of bizarre world and there's no security either way. For anyone really. There's no security for anyone e anyway. So, um, yeah, I, you know, I'm like, what are the skills going to have? Do I, can I make buckets? I don't know. You know, I, I, I right. I mean, and, and I would also say even, even for the, um, I would say even in the C-suite, I, I don't even think it's that secure. It's either, there's either obviously the underperformance um, issue, you know, the revenue, but also, I mean, you know, seeing CEOs kicked out for sort of not getting it either. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, there seems to be a variety of um, ways to kind of lose your job at this moment, yeah. um, which, you know, it just, it doesn't, in-house is no guarantee you're going to be safe. Yeah. Oh, that's you know that's another thing in this environment like you've got all this stuff going on there's anxiety there's no there everyone i think everyone's feeling unsafe in so many ways um yeah i yeah uh right. hopefully i'll have a job next week we'll see you know we just don't we don't all of us right we don't know. Yeah. Danielle, do you have one more um yeah i'm love to see i think let's see michael williams he wants to know are you finding any trepidation via potential partners knowing the public awareness needed and value added that you're 
like social impact efforts bring to the projects and beyond? Um, there, there, some, uh, I, you know, people are, are very, um, wary of anything that will, you know, take audiences away from the, from, from the projects. And our goal is always to, uh, and I think we talk about them with this, is to enhance um, the work. It's never to take away um, from the work. So sometimes there, you know, like I said, there may be an issue in the movie that, you know, they don't want to, to, to tackle, especially during the promotion of the movie. So then it's like working with them like, hey, so maybe we'll work on this part during the promotion phase, like kind of before the movie opens. And then after kind of the movie opens, we can work on this other, um, use the movie as a jumping off point for some of the work on this other issue. So yeah, there is, there's always, you know, in a corporate kind of setting trepidation around work that people feel may uh, politicize or polarize um, folks, polarize an audience. Uh, so I would say there's always trepidation, but we always try to work with them and have them understand how we approach the work. And it's always because also we are, we have a stake in it because we're also a financier. So yes, we want the movie or the project uh, to do well also. So we, we work through that. But I think because we have skin in the game, we're able to, to kind of allay those, those fears that people may have. You know, Sonia, I could be here all day. <laughs> uh, well, my battery's going down, so I can't. So uh, such like a little red has started coming up. <laughs> right, such great information. So um, before we go on, um, do you have some resources that you want to refer? We always ask, you know, what are some of the things you're reading, looking at, important stuff you want to pass along? Here we go. Yes. Um, so for me, especially during this time that we're in, Mm -hmm. I was thinking of that, and so um, the documentaries, I'm Not Your Negro, brilliant, James Baldwin, Can Never Fail, um, the 13th, as we talk about like what's going on in criminal justice in this country. Um, I think about the, the two articles when we talk about representation and uh, how these two shows, which were like, you know, bedrocks for some of us of a certain age growing up, the 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 intentionality um, that both of those shows use to to show uh, people of color to show all children of all um, hues and backgrounds, which I just think are really interesting. Um, Brian Stevenson just his talk about injustice and just when Brian talks, it's just you know, it makes me want to just constantly do everything to save the world. And I think just specifically on this work, this report, making waves, and it talks about. Uh, cultural strategy around it, using culture and impact for people who are, are, are looking to do this work. I think that's a, a good resource. Fantastic. Um, so thank you for that. I, I'd also like to just uh, check in with Cliff DeCatrell, our membership chair. Uh, he has a few things he'd like to talk about. Cliff, take it away. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sandy. And Sonia, thank you for that amazing session. Uh, so I just wanted to introduce myself. Uh, as uh, Sandy mentioned, I'm the member chair for Southern California chapter of NAMIC, also director of national and local markets for the Associated Press. And I'm pleased to say that I've been a member of NAMIC for over 25 years, uh, proudly yeah. serving on a variety of uh, boards, including New York and Southern California chapter. And for those of you who don't know, uh, name it too well, we wanted to tell you that it's been around for 40 years. Uh, and our mission has always been about educating, advocating, and empowering for multi-ethnicity uh, and diversity in uh, the media and entertainment industry. So our, it's our firm belief that our success comes from our ability to provide resources that allow members to cultivate their individual careers and meet those challenges uh, that face our community every single day. So we're really happy uh, to be here. So as if COVID wasn't enough, uh, for many of us, the last 37 days have been, you know, after George Floyd's passing, have been amongst the toughest in, in our lives. And 
the world is changing and organizations like Name It can really make a difference and have a long lasting impact towards solving some of these problems that we face, not only in our society, but also in the industry that we've chosen to work in. So today I wanted to talk about Name it membership. If you're not currently a member, let me explain why you should join. Uh, if you're already a member, then we'd love to see you participate more and actively uh, in supporting our events by joining one of our six committees. Uh, firstly, uh, your membership dues really do help us bring events like today uh, and make them possible. And in the future, a more in-person events, hopefully is, it becomes possible to do that. So why, sh why should you be a NEMIC member? First of all, our organization uh, creates communities of like-minded people like yourselves. And it's an opportunity to build those lifelong relationships, some of mine who go back 30 years, with professionals from all ethnicities, cultures, worldviews, and committed to a future in which uh, differences, our differences are our strengths. And NAMIC really believes in increased commitment to diversity, and it's just a simple, good strategy for business. The second reason is networking. Um, it allows you to have, your local chapter allows you to have immediate connections with hundreds of seasoned professionals and allows you to access those folks by participating in our programs and cultivating those relationships and, and, and eventually, hopefully, meet some hiring managers if you're looking to make a, a job shift. Uh, one of the other reasons is our discounted pricing. So members only uh, registration prices to attend NAMIC events are available for NAMIC members. And you would also be uh, allowed to participate in the annual membership conference, which we won't have next year, but next, uh, this year, but we will have next year. You also get access to our um, expert uh, directory with over 4,000 industry professionals via our membership login, complimentary learning, online learning, uh, voting privileges, and the ability to participate in our leadership development program. It's called the Executive Leadership Development Program, e ELDP, and our very own Sandy Nunez and uh, Emery Wal Walton have been members and of that. And Sonia. Uh, Sonia has been a member of that, yes. Um, mm -hmm. And for those of you who don't know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's offered as a partnership with the University of Virginia Garden School of Business and a globally recognized program with a really proven track record of e executive education. We also have a mentoring program, which we are in the process of developing and, and making bigger and stronger. Um, and our members only job bank, which gives you access to opportunities that you may not be able to find elsewhere. So I would like to make a call to action to all of you. Um, on By the way, call. I think uh, I think Marco just po posted a job on that job bank too. Oh, so there, you, there you go. There you got go. stuff going on there. Yeah. Go ahead, and, Cliff. Sorry. No, it's okay. That's great. Uh, Marco, we, for we, yeah, there you go. <laughs> we, we, we really do need your help to make these events happen. And we're asking for you to join a committee. The work we do is essential, uh, especially now more than ever. So please join one of our six committees headed by our committee chairs. And um, I'll just top line give you uh, who, what the committees are. The Treasury and Sponsorship Committee headed up by Danielle Green. Our Communications Committee headed up by Marcy Perez. Our Membership Committee headed up by yours truly. Uh, our Event committee, committee headed up by Jeff Eberle. Our media committee headed up by Evelyn Gilliam and our programming committee headed up by Angie Benaventura and Karen Williams. So with that, uh, we can really use your help. So please join a committee. And if you're not already a member, please join NAMIC and become a member. You can find our website at www.namic.com or namicsocal.org. And uh, if you need some more information, you can email us at namic socal at gmail.com. So thanks everybody for listening. And on behalf of NEMIC SoCal, we'd really love to thank everyone who attended and for all of those who made it possible, especially my amazing, our amazing board. Thank you for all your hard work, your love, your passion for our mission. I am honored to be working with you. And a very special thank you to Sonia Lockett for sharing her wisdom with us today. So have a great weekend, everyone. And I'm up doing my membership, updating my membership. Re re oh, updating. thank God. Yes. I thought we thank were going to break the bank. Um, thank, thank you, you so much. <laughs> I was like, we need more money. Um, <laughs> so uh, just a quick shout out. Um, thank you to Danielle, to Marcy, uh, for those of you who 
Keir Knight is our vice president. She's also on this Zoom. Cliff, thank you for all that. Sonia, I don't even know what to say. Other than I'm calling you, we're gonna have a drink soon. Uh, and we're gonna get Karen on there too. Um, but uh, for everybody, thank you so much for um, joining us. I mean, this is as great as it gets. It's an incredible conversation. Thank you for being so authentic and really kind of just walking us through the journey. I mean, what an incredible story. Um, and I look forward to hearing more. I'm looking forward to you uh, hanging out with us, Namek folks, more now that we've connected again. When the world opens up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it does. And um, Chandra, that goes to the you know the point you mentioned. Um, you just have to kind of keep that networking going. Really important. I would really, really appreciate it for all of you who uh, joined us today. Please, please, please go onto our. I see a lot of chat comments, and I'm so, so appreciative. It would really be fabulous if you also followed our Instagram. Um, I don't know if you're Facebook, but if you're not, Instagram is fine. Name it SoCal. Um, and drop a few a few comments on there. Um, if you aren't following us, please follow us. Make sure everybody knows how great this is because I'd love to have uh, more powerhouse speakers like Sonia in here. Um, and we can only do that if you keep supporting us. So thank you so much. It was really fun. Uh, all right, everybody. Let's go. Let's party. Talk Thanks to you later. Everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.